I'm so pleased um, to welcome these writers to this evening's reading. Cin Cindy Bosley, a longtime citizen of Toledo, is a poet, essayist, and quilt artist. She holds a poetry MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and is the author of The Siren Sonnets. And one of her quilts appears in One Block Wonders of the World. Her new book is Quilt Life, published by Bottom Dog Press. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm really pleased to be here and excited about Lit Youngstown hosting, hosting this event. The first poem I wanted to open with is, um, is from my new book, A Quilt Life, which is, as you said, published by Bottom Dog Press, which is an Ohio uh, small press. And uh, that came out last May and um, has been very exciting and uh, uh, certainly something to keep my mind and my, and my computer occupied during the pandemic. This poem out of the book is called Churn Dash Meditation. And it's the poem maybe most directly about quilting. Um, Churn Dash, if you're not familiar with uh, quilt block names, is, is a traditional quilt block. And I'll show the cover just enough. It is this um, single square with triangles and in, in a particular pattern. And it does supposedly come from the actual churn used for butter and, and other making. So Churn Dash Meditation. One, at home alone in a striped bra, I browse the internet for poster size images of the known universe. You probably know the ones, those maps of the multiple galaxies that say you are here. You've probably watched digitally animated versions online, their titles coming up as Facebook memes dressed like scientific articles with which exponentially with hypothetical light years expand the situation where you are so that you are illustrated as a cosmic molecule and can finally feel your smallness, your own instantaneousness. You are a cup of noodles, carrot and pea and corn kernel, reconstitutable in under three minutes. I, fellow human, am a tea bag of herbs and leaves. We think we know we roam across earth as if on a piece of barley fallen loose from the measuring cup headed to the crock pot. And we are so literally bits of nothing, empty like the gap where my key hangs on the ring. Is it any wonder then that everything ripples in packets, not waves, carried by the energy of fear and loss? Two, I've been listening to a couple meditation guys on audiobook. I am here, but only for a speckle, a pock, a grain of black pepper in a spice jar, among jars, in the spices factory, just one, black pepper fleck in the vat of pepper flecks, each of us. Mostly what I feel is the gravity of spin, the force of living, beings trapped by speed and a mean face on the merry-go-round. And I'm searching for the Milky Way poster because I think it would help pass the blink of an instant years, thickening like a churn of butter, a child grinding that handle, the churn so heavy, the butter thickening, the dash doesn't want to move, and we are here, round stick in a square hole, churning, or mortal and mortar and pestle, simple tools in the powerless fleeting hands, if the universe has hands. And I'd have to check that map. The highway rest stop surely has one, but they say human pains pass, hurts fade. The universe though will expand forever. The unified field is open. Come on, let's crush each other. It'll be over in less than a moment. And then as I was um, reading through my fellow poets uh, books, I, I was of course uh, noting, and maybe you'll hear one later, noting from Paige some uh, um, common themes common to me in terms of um, parents with dementia or aging and other things. So, so this one um, is called Alzheimer's Early Onset. Yesterday, Picking up an orphan t-shirt from my daughter's friend's house, I drove back and forth down the street five times and back again one more time to see if it was just springtime and tree blossoms shunting the frost behind them, their insistent explosion of green, keeping the house from looking like its winter self. 
The house would not jump out for me. When I called the mother, busy like me, I had the wrong street, one street over. And it was funny, but always the question, when does the forgetting come fully upon me? There's the note on my office computer. Class starts at 12.55, leave here at 12.47, but only if it's Tuesday or Thursday, note to self. I have always been absent-minded, something to laugh at in midlife, in class, talking, 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 and then the word blank comes, like digital buffering. I ask them, oh shoot, it was right here. What's the word for when you hunt for something? They wait politely. It comes to me and we laugh. Investigate, that's the word. I feel words leak out, like a slow oil drip from the valves of an engine. So slow, the oil change will refill the, what's the word, the reservoir. It's okay, it's not a word I use every day before anyone ever notices the leak. This can go on for years. Last week at a friend's house, something else, tissues in my hand after a sneeze. I asked, do you have a, a throwing away place? Trash can had oozed off the mental countertop, maybe on my way there. I watch for it. I keep notations inside my very detailed planner. My private notes look more and more like Aunt Luena's in the home, wake, bathe, meds, food. I check them off when they are complete because later I will look at those bottles on the counter and have no memory of the morning routine. Maybe that's normal, maybe that's menopause. I ask my daughter, but my daughter, my doctor about early onset, about testing. I do the puzzles. My brain stays plenty busy. How can it not? There is so much to remember. My father died of Alzheimer's. My doctor brushes me off, says that in 10 years, it won't even be a thing. The research is coming right along, he swears. Meanwhile, my father died of Alzheimer's and I can't remember if it's Thursday. I hated him the most of my siblings, but in the worst of it, just the worst of it, before it got really bad, during the weeks he still had a cell phone in his hand and knew that it was for calling people. It was me he called in the middle of the night, leaving messages. Cindy, hello, are you there? He didn't remember about voicemail. He didn't even remember answering machines. Can you imagine forgetting so far back that the person who loves you least in this world is the one your muscle memory, arthritic fingers dial in the middle of the night? Think of the valve leak, oil slowly easing through a seal for years, quiet. But now, the moment just before bursting, think of the full hot cup splashing just one What's the word? Molecule onto the hand. Think about the coffee pot left on all day, overheated but still whole until that one final instant before it cracks. Can you also feel the mind's skyward rocketing and every day O-ring about to give way? Thanks. <laughs> This poem um, I chose because it was written in a sort of a, in a few months of, after a few months of like grief where a number of things were happening and um, you know, it was just one of those, what could else could possibly happen? Of course, this is pre-pandemic. So, so uh, this poem is called, Until All the Terrible Things Have Happened. Life is a crew cut bully, hanging out leisurely behind a tree Butterfly knife open, twirling it like a baton between his fingers, t-shirt sleeves rolled up around a 1950s cellophane of cigarettes. He knows you're coming. After a few really awful things have happened, you don't want to know what else might be ahead. And after grieving another recent heartrending tragedy, when you still count all your children alive beside you, still feel your beloved rustling a sleepy turn in the bed, still twist on the faucet for the cat. You just want to hunker down, cancel the day's appointments, get low, greet your knees in the broad daylight, scooch under the end table beside the sofa and quiver there. Thanks. I have uh, two more poems I'll read. This one is called Mystics and you know, it's one I actually haven't read, I don't think, at a reading because it's longer. 
Um, however, it's broken into sections, and so maybe the break of sections will help it seem like a series of short poems. <laughs> Mystics. One, there are hundreds of Catholics, disheveled but Sunday dressed, and sitting with little space between them. Some pockets are empty in the crowd, pockets of coats and pockets of absence in the pews. One or two ladies will faint before the end of mass. It is so hot and it is always the ladies who faint. They are overcome with Christ, I prefer to think, and images of their own interior castles. Two, the priest has some sense of his grandness, sashaying the aisle, one boy with the Bible, one boy carrying the cross. We observe as the priest's pale, bored face reenacts the theater before us. It is a minor holy day, so the incense pot is cantilevered across the vast sanctuary as if it were a head. And we think immediately of St. John the Baptist and also King Herod, but there are 15 verses referring to beheadings in the Bible. Unfortunate end, someone mutters, who is also thinking these thoughts. Three. Father, it has been 17 months since I have set foot in your holy building. I like the singing though. Four, some think it easy to visit a church alone. I myself have often walked to mass, first as a girl because my mother did not go, but insisted I must. And then as a divorcee, walking down the steps from my apartment and over a few yards. Grandmother would be pleased I lived so close, but disappointed that I spent so little time there. She knew better than I did that I'd never be a nun. She told me, a child who just confessed a kindergarten crush, that the faint freckle on my ring finger meant a man would never want to marry me. My first answered prayer was that the freckled disappeared. Five, why did my sister and I do it? Why did we strike out for Saturday confession before Easter just because our mother said so? Why did we sit one by one in the dark room with only the priest and the other shamed person on the other side of the priest with his or her screen closed, but listening quick for every word, as of course we all did? Why didn't we take off for the grocery store, which was closer, and bother the market man and buy some brightly colored jawbreakers with our alms money? Mother forbade us to light the votives near the statue, and we obeyed that too, except for the one I lit by praying it would light. Six, to walk into a church alone now is to wear a bright coat of flame. I prefer to sneak in completely unseen, to move like Strider in Lord of the Rings, wearing a black hood and smoking a pipe, sulking in a corner. I want a mission as grand and dangerous as Frodo's with a wizard and a dragon, where now I have a coffee cup and a pen and a bed in the same room where I cook. Seven. And the ring I want is one of marriage still. Who knew how tricky it would be to find? Eight. I think only once have I ever made love with a man who loved me in equal measure to my love for him. I'll never know if I'm right about that. Nine. From kindergarten class, I walked home alone and lost some papers every day. My mother scolded me and I cried. At Halloween, it was my number drawn to win the class pumpkin. When my mother arrived, she talked to me about sacrifice, talked me into leaving the gourd behind for another child who might not have a pumpkin. At St. Patrick's Day show and tell, the rough boy, Russell, showed his four-leaf clover bound delicately in cellophane. And we were told the clover was magical, but grew commonly. For many springtimes yet to come, I hunted my backyard for any common and delicate squares of cellophane. Thank you. I'm going to pause there and, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Cindy. Paige Hill Starzinger's first poetry collection, Vestigial, I'm, I'm sorry, Vestigial, selected by Lynn Emanuel, won the Barrel Street Prize. Unshelter, chosen by Mary Jo Bang, won the Know Me Chapbook Contest. Her poems appear in American Poetry Review, Fence, and Volt. Her new book is Vortex Street, published by Barrow Street Press. Welcome, Paige. Thank you so much. It's great to be here reading with Cindy and Indran. I'm going to start with um, this poem from Vortex Street. 
excavations from the tomb of the second pharaoh, 12th century. No thanks, I don't want to take the survey. The young waxer touches me in a way I know she thinks I'm old. I recognize it because I touch my mother this way. This is me, stripped bare, a knee I don't know, a long back that's familiar, a stranger's breast. How do you settle in a body for so long still want it to change, still it changes. Annotated legs, enlarged knuckles, skin tone muddied, some firm padding gone. I ask the guard where Middle Kingdom is and he shows me. Coffins with mummies tipped sideways, heads lined up with blue rimmed eyes so they can see life through the casket. Leg, lotus, snails, snakes, ankh. Necklaces so delicate, amulets strung on thin strings, lack of clasps, and they survive. The next poem um, I'm going to read uh, from is uh, called Specula, and it's a long poem, and I'm going to read the beginning and then a middle section. Specula is a medical instrument um, for examination. It dilates. It's also the Latin word for mirror. Specula. To the man pressing the sonogram over my ovary, saying it's completely shut down, it is still part of my body. It is alive. It is mine. I want to know, is it velvety if you hold it? Is it ghostly white? Is it fragrant? Does it hum? Magnificent glands, corrugated, grooved, furrowed. This is where my children would have sprung if you could time lapse back. Alea, meaning dice, as an aleatoric music. Mozart selected a precise sequence of notes based on throwing a handful. Beauties, we are, we say, beautiful, estradiol in our vaginas and windswept fires in our veins. And here's a middle section of this. What of need when you want less? When you think you want less, when the self is less, you think. Look how my bones, osteoporosis, my pelvis, endometriosis, my ribs, fractious. This is the house, my house, my only home. I own no other, I lease one car. This is the, my body, the beauty, yes, I abandoned to feed on more expensive tastes. A cage to decorate became a cage to pain. This structure, this cage. If I could build a cage instead, how do you disinherit yourself? Normal faults create space when the ground cracks. But as one tectonic plate forces itself on another, this is a thrust fault. I am full of faults, natural mistakes. They lie until uncovered. covered. 
This next poem um, re references two or three um, articles in the New York Times and they're about they're violent. So I'm just giving you a warning. <laughs> Hook. To hang from heels, 24 articulating vertebrae falling into their own curves, this backbone, same for swans as sloths, dangling thread of bored young men and beautiful deer they called her who vanished did not respond for article headlined gang rape routine and invisible. Is one surprised? Now reporting, huh, is the only universal human word, not mama, as linguists believed. Especially as Carmen Tarleton emerges with a new face stitched to her scalp after her husband beat her with a baseball bat, soaked her with industrial lye squirted from a dish soap bottle. A spineous process downward and backward to the sacral pelvic girdle. Atlas and axis aligning like a bowspring. This next one has a lot of different voices, so it's it's hard to hear. Um, and uh, the first one is um, marketing jargon uh, from um, digital um, modules that that I had to take um, at, at a cosmetic company when I was a, a editor. Um, and the second one is um, well, they're they're working women that were icons when I was growing up on the TV, icons. Um, and the third, um, the end of the poem, it references a child and it's a child I did not have. And if, if you, you'll see in the rest of the book that I talk to the child, the child appears in various ways. And this is an appearance of that child. my learning path. Today, my digital learning module says, it's crucial that your presence is optimized. I can see that. My eyes are bleary. I'm baffled and blown over by learning how to pull a qualified consumer through the purchase funnel. Remember Mary Tyler Moore tossing her tam o shanter up into the city lights lit sky at 7th and Nicolette in a double breasted peacoat, that huge smile. An unwitting extra, just plain old Hazel Frederick, exits the department store in cat eye glasses, forever caught between the words and the final credits. Today, the username or password for your outgoing mail server is incorrect. You are bringing content to life. But there is an issue. I mean, opportunity, time decay. Shelly Hack, remember her? Leaping out of a cream convertible Rolls Royce and striding into, was it Cafe Carlisle? Bobby Short on piano, first time a woman wore pants in a fragrance ad, 1973. I must abandon the period, once a pause, now unnecessarily harsh. Snap my chat. Thanks for joining me today as we disrupt. Today, at Celine's runway show in Paris, the designer who knows what real women want, played a soundtrack of far off city traffic and children's voices as if they were getting dropped off at school. Need a trouser suit? 
a reporter asks. On every seat, a quote from artist Dan Graham. I want to show that our bodies are bound in the world, whether we like it or not. Today, I'd say we like it. They are citrus, cyclamen, tarragon, oak moss, and rose. And I will name you, my child, and you shall exist like a character in a fictive world so true that we touch. Velvet petaled, starry jasmine, climbing mossy stone walls at the edge of a forest of unknown parts. The wind catching tendrils, birds feathers, dried weeds, lifting them up in circles, no script, no credits, no. And do I have time for one more? Um, this is the last poem um, in the book and it's called Landing. Landing. And about his touch, slightly salty sun brown, pressing down into bed sheets, faint aroma of pool, nestling of green palm fronds on window, and then trying another way, tan earlobe, blue speckled eyes, round sides and feet, the soles, relaxing finely. Sound from somewhere inside me I'm not familiar with, as if I evaporated to reappear, shorn, stepping outside myself. No, in the mirror afterward, recognizing my mother's white hair, remembering her saying how much she liked mine when it was long, and then grief like a sudden thing, or so it seemed. Stepping barefoot into a tidal bay, slipping into briny waves, thinking of what lies deeper than I will go. Basket stars extending arms like nets to catch small crustaceans. Lava crystallizing into glass as it tumbles through mesopelagic waters. Consider, from the time of Pliny until the 19th century, no one thought there was life at great depths. You say I am melancholy, but how beautiful to think of what lies further out. If regret is part of this, so be it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paige. Indram Amirtha Nayakam writes poetry in English, Spanish, French, Haitian, and Portuguese. He has published 19 books, including the Patterson Prize winner, The Elephants of Reckoning. He is a 2020 Poetry Fellow from the Contemporary, from the Foundation for the Contemporary Arts and edits the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. His new book is Migrant States, published by Hanging Loose Press. Welcome, Indra. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, it's a real honor and, and, and uh, a devastating honor to follow such, such heartbreaking poems that I've just heard, uh, we've just heard tonight. Really a, a thrill to be with you, um, Cindy and Paige, and, and thank you, Karen, for bringing us together. Um, I'll, I'll begin at the beginning of the book, uh, though I, I won't read the preface, uh, and it's, it's a sort of a journey through these migrant states and uh, when we, when we first came to America, we came to Hawaii, to Honolulu. Uh, I was a teenager. I, I'd come from London. I was born in Ceylon, an island, that, a country that no longer exists. It's now known as Sri Lanka. And uh, we came first to London and then to the United States through the airport at Los Angeles at LAX on the way to Honolulu. So landing in Honolulu, so my first real geographic American experience was in, on the island of Oahu. And on that island, one day, a couple of years after arrival, my father 
took me in his car uh, and we went to the airport to pick up a visiting poet, a famous poet who had been, he'd been described to me as the leading poet of America. And, and, and Allen Ginsberg came down uh, his black beard and his, in his harmonium. His, and uh, we put a lay on him and we, we sat each, and he sang to us in the car as we drove back. It was really a thrill for me uh, to be um, sort of in the car with this, my dad, who was a very fine poet and, and his friend, Allen Ginsberg, uh, who was such a well-known figure. And then we get to the house and the phone rings. Uh, Alan stayed with us that week and I pick up the phone. And can you imagine, it's Bob Dylan calling for Alan Ginsberg. So I had this thrill of bringing the phone over to Alan and saying, you know, Bob Dylan is calling for you. So the messenger between those two, they were working on Rolling Thunder Review at the time. So mind breathing. I have missed mind breaths left by accident at a bus stop in Wailai, Kahala in 1979. Two years earlier, I heard Allen Ginsberg sing Father Death Blues from the manuscript. On November 17th, 1960, I breathed for the first time without maternal assistance on a cot at McCarthy Nursing Home, a few blocks from our residence in Colombo. Alan brought a harmonium as a carry-on music box on his flight to Oahu. Back then, nobody examined strings for chemical traces, death marches, laments. My most treasured documents, letters from Alan to my father, painting by Jose Luis Cuevas that graced the front cover of my first Spanish book, comment from a certain President Clinton about the tsunami in poetry, together in a file that disappeared in 2006, after our house was ransacked by unidentified human beings in search of food, drink, money, and letters written by the author of Mind Breaths. This is not a joke. I bear witness to these losses here as my own attempts to speak in breaths shall infuse a poem able still to coagulate, distill, strain a few thousand disparate disappearances into verse. Friends and readers, hypocrites, I love associating with the most damned dramatic traditions and saints, Francis, whom I embraced at confirmation and many other inspiring stuffs for each day and hour of our persistent walking ahead in spite of inclement accidents, robberies, forgetfulness, come and drink. Now, thank you. You know, I so enjoyed that book, Mind Breaths. You know, in that book, Alan has a poem, a song, Father Death Blues, and, and I literally lost it on that bus stop back in 1979. Alan, Walt Whitman shows up in this book. I, you know, his 200th birthday was last year, and uh, or in many places there were celebrations, and in Washington, where I live, I live in Rockville, just outside of Washington, we organized about a 10 days of readings and events and seminars and Kim Roberts, who, who is reading for you next week, was key to organizing those events. And, uh, and um, she was the former editor of, of Beltway Poetry Quarterly as well. So uh, it's a very family business and a personal business poetry, you know, everybody's linked to each other. Um, anyway, uh, Walt Whitman, I, I got to participate in a couple of those events. And then I started writing poems uh, in dialogue with Whitman, and and they ended up being strung through this book, The Migrant State. So um, I'll read a couple of those. Um, Walt 200, written on his birthday, on that 200th birthday. Break the locks, unleash the mind. Walt Whitman has left Pomanoc. He is abroad. He is sitting among us in our soul. He flies the post with pigeons and the giant freight planes. He hops freight trains and rides into Mexico. He's on a piano cruise visiting St. Kitts and Barbados. He has joined the Merchant Marine. He sails into Guantanamo. He throws fish into the sea in search of whales. He has the biggest, longest beard in the world. He jives, thrives, cavorts, shimmers. He is 200 years old today and he does not give a flying rat. He's in your mind, Mr. President even if you cannot smother 
or scratch or squeeze him out. He is gloriously spirit, gadfly, rabbit and sloth. He nurses our democratic wounds. He knows how to write history from the pebbles view, the side glance of the wren, the snake hanging in the tree. He is black and white and all shades of gray. He is our friend and guide and he will elect us every time we fall down. Let us go back to Pomenok with what we've learned these 200 years. Let us go back to set forth again, Walt Whitman in our backpack. You know, the notion of setting forth again, I, I, we just edited I just the, the Beltway Poetry Quarterly and we call the issue, The Dream Returned. I mean, I, I, I have a few, we have a sense I think now in, in America that the dream is back that we can dream it again. And we can also go back to Langston's Hughes's poem, The Dream Deferred and, and see you know, where we can now move it forward. And uh, so it's a happy time, despite the, the tragedy of the pandemic that we're living through now. And so these poems, even though they were written before, they, they speak to me uh, uh, in, in this time, you know, and um, they're of this time. I, uh, one of the, things, uh, at least uh, in some poems we do is, is we look back and we, we remember and we, and we memorialize. Poems I've always used to say, I always say, are good not only for funerals and commemorations. I think they have, they can make things happen, despite what Horton said that, you know, that poetry makes nothing happen. So one of these, the simple sort of nostalgic poems in this book is called Prelude, going back to the Manhattan and the New York life that I used to live and knew. To live on the island, satisfied basic needs, poetry readings in the evenings, noodled curries, belly dancing and love and gardens, famous writers on street corners, monuments, chestnuts, ice and hibiscus, movies filmed in the fruit market and paintings in grand salons and love and smacking bites of a burger with a pint, the jeweled eye of a fish, a tailor who survived the number branded on his arm, the delight of lingering over a glass of wine, the chat in love, sunrise and sunset over two splendid rivers. Um, thank you. I will read now another poem, uh, Sort of, I think poetry also is a kind of uh, written against melancholy, or, or even though it, it's born in melancholy. And and um, Sundays, this is a Sunday, but a happy Sunday. But sometimes Sundays are like this. It's called recalling Sunday. I fought the blues on so many Sundays. I've lost count of hours frittered away and sifting through the past to understand why. I carry a peculiar strain of melancholy that pierces all activity and must in the end be endured, tempered by the mass, a story shared at evening with my daughter, a cricket game relived fondly when far removed from the pitch. And dare I say it, in company of that bitch life who does not spare even Sunday to poke a dagger into memory. Um, I think of of course, of all the people I love and my daughter, my son among them, you know, they are doing different things. My son did the cover of this book, actually, um, The Migrant States, and, and he has done the covers of two or three of my books, uh, including Uncivil War. Um, and my daughter, uh, now 14, is with her mother in, in Argentina. So, the pandemic has meant we can't see each other, but there's so many people have been separated by the pandemic, but we, we keep in touch. And um, um, let me read now two poems, uh, thinking of them. One is called uh, Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now and I am sad, and the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories alive. And you ask, Dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turn red and yellow 
and the mornings bristled with the sun, and the sun seared yet left your skin cold. A cold sun, Dad, I feel it too. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash, and what's to do? Yes, write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed and know there's no morning flight and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. Um, and morning mass, uh, Halloween for Lola. Hushed tones, place of worship, early morning. A woman kneeling in the pew could not get up. The priest brought her communion. Then another parishioner called for an ambulance. The fireman, a friend of the ambulance driver, arrived in his fire truck. They worked together naturally. What to do now? Walk to the font, dip fingers in holy water, then go out to my car. Paramedics will lay her on a stretcher, pump her heart, wheel her away to the hospital. Life is coming to its end, a repeat. In my dad's case, his heart stopped while he kneeled at a pew. Nobody could revive it. He would have loved to see my daughter smiling as she guards the witch's cauldron this Halloween, sweets in hand. She loves ghoulish stories, so she approves of that for him, <laughs> despite its melancholic details. Um, maybe she'll be a crime writer further on. Um, I have a few minutes, I think. Um, let me let me read another of the. Um, uh, it's a. This book was edited by Dick Lurie, who is a poet and an editor uh, and a founder of one of the founders of Hanging Loose Press. And Dick uh, actually edited my two other books of mine as well, The Elephants of Reckoning and The Splintered Face Tsunami Poems. And it 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 the book went through many evolutions and. Uh, um, and so uh, a, a book, you know, I'm glad for the editor. So thank you, Dick. Um, Il Miglio Fabro, you know, Elliot wrote about Pound, you know, the better craftsman. So we need our editors and just thank you for that. Um, one of the poems that um, uh, uh, in the Whitman series throughout this book, um, uh, let me, I'm not sure how, I've lost track of time. So let me, I think I have probably time for a couple more poems. Is that right, Karen? Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll read this poem called Emotion again, and then I'll fin finish with a little sort of ditty that was made into a song actually. Um, so this one's called Emotion again. I ask the panel, the audience, what next? We have finished celebrating Walt Whitman's 200th birthday who will lead us into the next century? Do we find the driver in our own batteries, energy coursing through cells from foods we eat for body and mind? Like this delicious feast finished now, 10 days at summer's beginning to honor the founder of our Republic of Letters. Not the first, but the most expansive American who stretched his imagination to encompass the continent and travel beyond to India, to the moon, sun and stars, into the interior constellations in a leaf of grass. Walt Whitman, we do not want the party to end. We wish to keep stroking your gray beard, reading the day's news out loud as you lay dying in Camden, bedridden, reported on almost daily by the Times. If you had drunk milk punch, broth, and twice when you seem to have kicked the bronchial pneumonia, eaten a mutton chop. You dropped out of the news, too, when the paper thought you had improved enough to live without their noting every food and visitor, brother George, sister-in-law, biographer, favorite niece, Jessie, and your final physician, Dr. McAllister. Your last words, a request to attendant Fritzinger, worry, shift, roll over, Walt Whitman. You told the doctor, who asked if you were in pain? No, almost inaudibly. A wisp of smoke floating out of the row house 
into the street, mixing with the air, falling later on as rain, in poems and songs recollected in tranquility again and again. And uh, I'll, I'll end with this um, poem from the section of the book that's, um, that's called, uh, that reads, that has to do with an, uh, another part of America, which is Haiti. You know, I think of America as the, the, the continent and, and, um, and so there, there are American scenes here in Colombia, in Peru, and in Haiti. And um, this poem, which is a song actually in Creole called Tanzabocate Fini, the time the avocado season is over. Um, in English, it goes like this. The season of avocados is over. The most beautiful girl in town is about to marry a man across the water. My brother is busy with his manuscript. Time to share ideas in a book has gone to the country without a hat. Accept reality. Don't live anymore in fantasy. You are getting along in years, but have only spoken Creole for two. You have a great long life ahead. Think, reflect, tell all the new families congratulations good luck, then write again about your life in Haiti when the avocado was in bloom. Thank you very much, the migrant states. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yandran. What a wonderful reading. Thank you all. And I'm look, very much looking forward to the conversation about these books. Cindy, I was wondering if you would throw out the first question, please. Since uh, we are just still in the world of Indron's uh, poetry, I'll, I'll start with a question to you. One of the things that I appreciated the more I was reading in your book, um, Migrant States, is the, uh, the delicacy that you have with, with off rhyme, slant rhyme, those partial rhymes that are really beautiful. And um, I wondered um, in a number of the poems that that emerges as a very quiet kind of uh, extra sparkle, I guess I'll say. And I wondered how, how do you think about the rhymes as you are working, as you are creating a poem? Well, thank you very much. I, yeah, I, for me, uh, rhyme is uh, very important and, and uh, but uh, subtly coming into the line as 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 one as I'm writing, you know. Now, subtly, I, I think of poems almost like little whispering in in the ear, a kind of a confidence, an intimate exchange between uh, the the speaker of the poem and the reader or the listener, and 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 rhyming uh, and song making are are very much connected, you know. I think of poetry as a, a lyric, as a song. Uh, and and dance with words and so I think of the dance and the and the and the music and the words all being uh, as seamlessly as possible one one expression and so I I do think of the rhymes sometimes quite deliberately but I don't necessarily I don't try to impose the rhyme I, I feel I I trust in the instinctive sort of that the rhyme is born with the in the words in the in the phrasing. And when it's when it's there, I take it and I, I accept the gift. When it's not there, I I'll let it be for a bit. Uh, but I, I I think of Jared Bandley Hopkins or Dylan Thomas or I mean I, one can work the poem and and really uh, find the music in the language. I think in every language we have uh, an amazing word music. Uh, Walcott used to say in a ask the question. Uh, Donde está la música? Where is the music? When reviewing somebody's poem and saying, you know, well, where where is the music in there? So what is not to say that there's only one kind of poetry and uh, that's right and there's another kind that's wrong. But uh, rhyme is for me an important element, or off rhymes, or an alliteration and and sound plays are a very important part of of, of the, the mnemonic device, you know, the remembering the poem, the reciting the poem out loud, 
And I think that's, and you know, and the precision. Uh, 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 so uh, these are lyric uh, poems, but they're written in free verse, right? They're, 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 they're free, but they're even, but free verse has its own uh, compositional structures. You know, each, uh, I think that's something that, uh, that makes them makes it different from prose as such, or a prose poem. And uh, I definitely work in the territory of the lyric and, uh, and the free verse poem, as opposed to the prose poem, or as opposed to breaking the line arbitrarily. I, I, do, I do believe there's a reason why I break the line where I do it. I think it's a visual experience as well as an oral experience. So that's why it's good to have the book in hand or the poems in hand as well. It's just a it's just a richer experience, a richer encounter, uh, because it's a visual encounter as well as an oral encounter. But tonight we're having an oral encounter, which is wonderful. And um, I, 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 if I, if I may, I'll just, I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes a bit shy about technical uh, aspects of poetry because I, I, I come from a sort of mystical kind of relationship to to poetry. You know that it it speaks to you through the muse and the muse shows up somehow or you summon the muse like the genie on a bottle and then you and then you and and you get transformed you just start literally shaking with the beat of the poem as you're writing it i i wonder if i may turn the question around and ask because i as i was listening uh, uh to both your your poems uh, maybe uh i the precision and and the sort of devastating um frankness of uh, this, this is a different question now if i may move on the devastating frankness of your utterance both in both cindy and in pages that when i say devastating frankness i was it's unsettling it's it's revelatory and it's and it's incredibly um heartbreakingly honest you know i i, I felt that i was being privileged to uh almost the the, the raw truth you know as uh, precisely and as skillfully uttered as possible about very very troubling and 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 um, uh, so things so so is there anything maybe my question is um, if you've done that then is the poem then perfect is there something else that can be done to the poem then reveal that truth in such an un, such a frank and, and disarming and, and troubling way as, as you both do in different poems that we heard tonight. Would, would any of you want to think about this uh, notion of the perfecting of the poem? Is there at some point where you have to just accept that you have done uh, you know, your job mm -hmm. and the poem is, is done? Um, I'm sorry if it's, if it's not a, a very specific question, but I hope it'll lead to a, a reflection for both Paige and, and Cindy about, um, and when does the poem finish? When is the poem finished? Right. Um, I will say, I think often about um, the scope of my poems or, or even the lack of scope sometimes. Uh, I, I have to challenge myself to, uh, to think usually this happens not in the writing, but in revision a little bit. How could I, how could I layer this? You know, is there a piece of this poem that's not yet in place? Is there some other broader connection that that this hints at that I could draw out of it? So I appreciate what you're saying and thank you. Um, I really loved what you had to say about rhyme and lyric poetry as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Paige, yes. do you want to take his question? Yeah. So so that that complication and layering is something that I loved about Cindy's work, um, especially redacted, um, where you have these, you know, you're talking about miniature worlds and you're really setting them up. Um, they're different worlds and you're setting and you're showing how they crisscross or how they impact each other. So there's there's a whole nother thing going on that that takes it beyond the, the personal or beyond a specific um, episode. I mean, I think what Cindy's doing is creating these wonderful worlds I um, that are overlapping that that contain glitches. So I love that. There are always there are usually glitches. Um, you say in redacted the glitch writes itself eventually. And um, 
you know, that's something that can be found in a very small moment and expand it out to really huge moments as we've been seeing with the insurrection and everything. I mean, there, that's a wonderful way of looking at a personal moment. And especially if you layer showing how it, it bursts out into, into something else. And I don't wanna say bigger because I think going deeper into personal is, is often something that in itself um, opens up worlds and touches people and um, allows you to understand things that you know most of us might try to deny or not talk about or talk about only in a certain way that seems appropriate. And of course that appropriateness is, is very limiting, right? Especially for women and you know, what's appropriate for us to talk about and say is something that um, has been extremely limiting, extremely, you know, makes one invisible and um, is, you know, rather infuriating. So I think certainly I am trying to work against that. So it's not just hopefully the, a, a personal moment, but it's, it's about working against the construct, the context that's telling me I should only be seen it a certain way or not seen it at all, right? And then how that magnifies. Some of my poems, which are hard to read, have those layers like your redacted that, that get political. I mean, that go from Syria to you know, New York to wherever, and you see the explosion of, of the lack of attention and care and listening that we have that that operates on different levels, or at least I hope that's what it what's doing. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. sorry, I was going to leap from that, and and um, I think this is this is part of that in your work. How observing your work on the page in your books, you have a freedom with the white space and placement of lines. And uh, Indran was saying a moment ago how 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 very how much care he gives to where a line stops and breaks. And I would say that's even amplified further in, in your work because you're also moving around in the space of the page. And um, I was intrigued with the, how that would convey in an oral presentation of your work. And, you know, cause there are two different experiences of your poem. Would you say more about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I try. Uh, it's difficult because they're really written for the page. I um, mean, they're in my head. I'm saying them. So they there is an oralness to them, but they're written for that page and they're sort of felt down the page. And I, I mean, you know, like Indra, you're I, I mean, I assume you're, you know, the migrant states that are moving past boundaries, beyond boundaries, not letting those boundaries, you know, limit you that I, I felt in your your lines that there was this freedom of movement and and a sense of equality. I I I, I thought I was going to ask you about this because you often have um, line, either a big block, everything's equal, you know, that says that so clearly, nothing I'm not going to make one thing better than another or start or finish with something. It's equality of everything there. Or you know you go to from from couplets to couplet to couplet in, or, or triplets, and they're usually regular. So so they're nothing is pops out. Um, mine operate uh, uh, differently, but for different reasons. Um, Fascinating in what you were saying. Everything this conversation about about when you mentioned about borders and crossing borders, that's of course yes a very important thing to me. Just just it has just been both in my the details of my autobiography, but also uh, in, 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 in and what I write about and, and crossing borders also between languages and personally, because I write in these other different languages and, and, and write in them and try to write in them as much as I write in, in English. Uh, but but uh, when you said, talked about the prohibited and what the appropriate, you know, I just love, I just love that. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you've opened up both of you worlds of exploration uh, and in terms of autobiography, the poem is autobiographical. is fascinates me because I mean, in, in a sense, the eye is is an important element, at least in my poetry. But I mean, it's the autobiography. But the mirror is is convex or concave or distorted or or, or to, it's like the like the the surreal mirror or the or the uh, the cubist mirror or something. You know, it might focus on some aspect. Uh, and the rest of it is is diffuse, but uh, 
it's all about trying to get a truth, right? And get it as, as, as uh, detailed and as honestly uh, as possible. You know, 108 years old today and not one perfect poem written. That's a, a Robert Lack's uh, high vertical poem, you know? Um, so that, that the, the, uh, uh, Yeats wrote to us again, what then, you know, all of this, and then what then, what then, you know, this, this constant search to, to perfect and to reveal, and yet you have revealed for me in, the, in this evening and, and, in, and in reading your poems, these, um, these truths that must be spoken, you know? So in a sense, these are equalizing and democratic truths. So Whitman, though, he it was a poet of his time, speaks to our time and to this struggles that you are, political struggles that you are engaging in in your, in your poetry. So I, I celebrate that and, and unite with that and, and uh, just want to do more of it myself, you know, as I look into my own um, organs, so to speak, and what they, what they offer and what they still offer and what they have offered, you know, over time. I, I'm fascinated by the, the subject matter and the, and the explorations you have. And I have done in this in these books in these poems, and you know, there is no subject that, that is more um, honor. I mean, you've written, taken on the these subjects, you know, aging and and memory and loss and 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 motherhood and and um, and uh, the loss of of motherhood. I mean, in the sense of the, the child that's not there or the child that did not come or the child that is expected it's fascinating fascinating great work and um i i, I work out of the lyric you know i work out of the musical uh, speech and then i move from there you know so in a sense i i my models are also singers like uh, dylan and and leonard cohen and so on but i and leonard but you can only move to the other side. You, you want to keep proving, testing, and crossing borders until you have to leave the, <laughs> the work to someone else, you know? So I think that's intellectually we need to challenge ourselves. And I think that's what I, I'm hearing tonight, a challenge to cross yet another border, at least in my own work. I, I take it very personally. I'm listening to your poems and I want to, to explore further my own uh, personas and the personas that I've acquired through reading and experiences living in different parts. And I do have a political agenda, which is both can be explained on different levels. I think, I think we all do, if I, if I may dare to say, have this, and it's not a bad thing. It's, a, it's actually a positive thing. It's not, it doesn't take away from the poetry. I, I, that sense, I feel we are a part of a community of poets who do not fear, uh, you know, the, the political poem or, do, or we are redefining it and making it more intimate and personal. And, and, it, it, and politics became very, very personal in our experiences in these last few years and, and continues to be, you know? I mean, so personal that you have people who die as a result of the politics in your families and in your community, people who lose their jobs. Uh, you know, we are going through this national um, and international um, depression in a sense, right? At the same time that there is wealth being created, there is this, there is this terrible, devastating 410 or 20,000 dead in America, uh, in the United States alone, you know, from COVID just, as one uh, devastating uh, chink in the in the American promise or the promise or the dream or the sustainable dream, you know. So I I think of climate change also. I don't think we talked about it directly, and but it's just a, it's uh, the human climate and and the human um, possibility. I think is expanded uh, through these points. So I, I celebrate your work and look forward to reading more of it and and invite. Um, invite you as well, if I may, I, I, to engage with others who are not poets, engage with the media, get people interested in the poetic interpretation, the poet making news, you know? I do really believe passionately in that. I, I, I find it in other countries. I write, for example, a poem 
as a column in a in a Dominican newspaper uh, in Spanish. Why do I do that? Because I like to. I mean, I like to write in Spanish, but I also think that poetry doesn't belong only to poetry audiences. In other words, we should try to move the envelope, and and that's another reason to talk of also about the the inauguration that just happened and the poem that was read there by Amanda Gorman and and what that you know could do for broadening the audiences for uh, for poetry and the place of poetry in American life. So, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going on about lots of things here. I'll stop there for a minute, but if you want to talk about that, do we have time to, to um, are we running out of time? We are, I'm so sorry that we are out of time. All but right, I sorry. want to thank you all so much. You've given us a lot to think about and thank you to those who are joining us. And I encourage you to buy these very fine books. So good evening. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Carol. Thank you. Real honor and pleasure to read Cindy and Paige with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, night. good evening. Good night. Good night.